god, what a little bastard. Bye, little bastard! Hello, friends, and welcome back to Red X, your source for the freshest daily Reddit content anywhere on the internet. Promise. Swearsies. Today, we are jumping right back into r slash Tales of Neckbeards. I know I said I'd try some other stuff this year, and I will. I totally will, but <laughs> them neckbeards just got me, man. This is another tale by user Ramtide, who's quickly becoming one of my favorite writers. Dang, oh. He's got like this tabletop bent to all of his stories, which seemed to work pretty well for the Madame Vatel story. Some people didn't seem to like it as much, where other people thought it was like the greatest thing ever. I happen to like it pretty well, and uh, it's my channel, so <laughs> that's what we're gonna do. I won't blame you if you run away in abject terror. At least this one wasn't posted in r slash game tales. It actually is from r slash tales of neckbeard. So I didn't have to ruse anybody this time, which uh, <laughs> I appreciate. Anyways, with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into this story. Nami Kun and the Barmaid. I recently had one of my stories read on Red X. Hey, and it got me all inspired to commit some more to text. Oh, bless you. <laughs> Hell yeah, guys. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, indeedy. And thank you for uh, sharing these stories for us all to enjoy. True to my heavy burden of Eternal GM, I present to you another tale from the tabletop. I really like that. <laughs> Clever. This one I shall lovingly subtitle, A Wench in the Gears. So is it a leg beard or a neck beard? I guess we'll see. This one was from way back when I first started to haunt my town's local game shop. I just moved to town and was looking to make some friends and get a tabletop group going. Fourth edition had just came out, and despite my misgivings about D&D as a system and staple, which I could expound upon at great length, I knew that it was basically a staple for a reason. If I put out the word that I wanted to run a campaign and was friendly with the local nerds, I could definitely get a game going. I made my rounds about the store, chatting it up with everybody. I started to round up players and collect some phone numbers. I don't like my campaigns to fail to meet or exceed a certain threshold of players. Five is the absolute maximum that I will suffer. <laughs> Three or less seems to me barely worth playing. Well, I'd found two so far when I made my way around the tables where some guys were playing magic. I watched the games and struck up a conversation with the players when they finished their match. Hi, my name's OP. I'm new in town and I want to get a campaign going. Would you be interested? I've got two people so far, and ideally I'd like two more. I do tend to agree that four is like the perfect number, basically. Most people would agree with that, I think. One of the guys at this particular magic game had some telltale warning signs about him. The first being that he absolutely decimated his opponent and was entirely smug about it. Surely, however, these signs weren't omens, I mistakenly thought. A dark hat of a very specific variety adorned his long, slick-looking hair, contrasting sharply with a brightly colored t-shirt covered in Japanese kanji. It's okay, we're all nerds here, and I enjoy anime myself. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit among the local game store crowd, so to speak. How bad could this guy actually be? Didn't matter. I just wanted to play, so I asked him if he'd like to join the group. Sure, OP, he says. I'll join your game. I've even got a friend who I could most likely rope into the game, too. He's been playing D&D forever. <laughs> He's really good. He'll probably even let us run the game at his house. Sweet. Guess we got ourselves a game. I rounded up the three guys I had found and got to talking about a scheduled day to meet up. After sorting our work schedules, we all agreed that midday Sunday would be the day. I asked my final recruit about his friend, and he said that he'd be free. He lives with his mom and doesn't really go anywhere. I collected the phone number of this mystery friend and then had his friend call him, putting him on speaker. When the line picked up, we were greeted with a gruff sounding, Hello? Followed by heavy breathing on the line. <sighs> I explained who I was and how I got his phone number, while my words seemingly disappeared into that endless, respirating abyss. <laughs> After a while, he said, <sighs> Sure, come over. I'll be here. Session Zero was a go. I usually don't hold Session Zero games, and I haven't in a long time since I found my core group of players, but 
I figured it would be for the betterment of this new and random group if they could all interface with each other while they went through character creation. It would let them get familiarized with the setting in which the game was going to take place, and the type of game that I like to run. They were effectively randos to each other as far as I knew, so it seemed like a good way for everyone to get to know each other too. Dutifully, I prepared my campaign notes and first encounters for our game. When Sunday came, I took that trip to our mysterious patron's house. It seems the others had already arrived, as there was a line of cars on the street. I knocked on the door and was greeted by a little old woman, maybe in her fifties, smiling warmly. This must be his mom. I introduced myself, and she told me that her son had mentioned that he was expecting visitors. She let me in and told me that his room was downstairs. The ground floor of the house was cluttered but well-lived and seemed cozy enough, and his mother was just so damn nice. She asked me if I wanted something to drink as she led me through the house, and I politely declined, but she insisted, and I acquiesced. She gave me an ice-cold Mountain Dew, <laughs> because of course. She led me to the basement door, upon which was hung a keep-out sign. I opened the door and was greeted with the musky, damp darkness of the basement stairwell. How appropriate. An IRL dungeon for a game of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> I descended into the stairwell and found myself in the belly of the beast. Beneath a bare bulb on a chain was a large table ringed with chairs. In the corner sat a trash can, overflowing with empty soda bottles and cans, and a towering stack of pizza boxes were beside it that had fallen over. There was another table, covered in Warhammer terrain, and shelves lined the walls, laden with comics, action figures, and other games. In one corner, a body pillow was propped up. A lustful anime girl with a tail and dog ears kept a silent and sultry vigil over this forbidden domain. <laughs> it took a minute to soak it all in before I pulled out a chair at the edge of the table and took a seat, pulling out my binders and dice. All the familiar faces were there. Across from me sat the fabled guardian of this realm. <laughs> he was a massive, lumbering creature with black pinpoint eyes hidden behind thickly rimmed glasses. Already balding despite being somewhere in his 20s, he fumbled mindlessly with his asthma inhaler, drawing in deep, uneven, and throaty breaths. His gray sweatpants and My Little Pony t-shirt hung over him like a tent about a flabby circus, stained with Cheeto dust, grease, and God only knows what else. <laughs> the odor that pervaded the room, I soon realized, was not from the room itself, but the stink of this beast that had long since permeated its lair. <laughs> it was mildly offensive, deep, musky, and rich with subtle hints of onions, curdling dairy, and general decay. Someone had already taken the liberty of opening the only window in the room, which ventilated the area fairly well. We were only met with the occasional breath of miasma. <laughs> At least we were given that courtesy. God, love this writing style. What took you so long? The beast growled. I looked at my phone. I was only a couple of minutes late. Everyone else was early, but they hadn't been waiting particularly long. I explained that traffic was bad, apologized, and asked if everybody was ready to begin. And so began Session Zero. I explained the setting to them. We were going to begin our quest in a small fishing village nestled in the spine of the World Mountains, known as Icewind Dale. Our wanderers had found themselves in this town after traveling with a caravan, or possibly just being from the town, and will begin their quest, as all good stories begin, at the local tavern. Rumors abound around the town of missing supply caravans from the east and sightings of monsters, and even things far worse in the mountain passes. It was entirely reminiscent of the first area from the Forgotten Realms video game that bore the town's namesake, Icewind Dale itself, to be honest, but it was familiar to me, a quick and easy setting to cobble together, and I use it as a setting in which to break in groups with which I'm unfamiliar. After they helped the town with one initial quest to get us rolling, they could take it in any which way they wanted. I had them assemble today for a session zero so that they could build their party for maximum efficacy. As I explained that my style of GMing was rather unforgiving. On a long enough timeline, death was a certainty, and encounters would be difficult right out of the gate. This was my reprieve, letting them optimize their party before the quest began. I laid out the rules for character creation. 46, drop the lowest die, and assign your values as you see fit. The lowest total value became an automatic 18. 
Everyone rolled their numbers and started to fill out their primary stat blocks. Everyone began to roll. I heard the beast mutter a few soft curses, but didn't think too much of it. When I walked around the table, I saw that he had rolled nothing below a 14. Okay, maybe it wasn't as high as he liked, but 14 isn't bad. It's just not outstanding. Nothing to be upset about. I didn't think too much of it, despite a suspicion about the real nature of this behemoth. Consistently rolling that high was a rarity. Did he fudge his numbers? Probably. Whatever. The books were cracked open, and people picked out their race and class. Everybody was content to stick to the books, minus a few questions here or there about whether they could sub out a racial trait or class feature for something else. I'm pretty lenient. It's just a game, you know, and we're all here to have fun. The Beast, however, asked me, Could I use my homebrew race? Sure. I'll humor you, bud. Show me what you got. He showed me a greasy coffee-stained page from his notebook that outlined the details of a race called the Kitsune. He enthusiastically elaborated that Kitsune was the Japanese word for fox, and that Kitsune were fox people from the Far East. They have superhuman dexterity and cunning, making them great rogues, thieves, and assassins. <laughs> God, already. I locked eyes with the canine-featured anime girl pillow standing guard in the corner. My doubts surged, but against my better judgment, I sighed, <sighs> looked at the stat modifiers and traits of this kitsune race, and seeing nothing inherently broken, said, go for it. The party eventually formed. From this point out, we shall refer to our players by their character names. OP, the GM, a fickle god and master, and may be referred to as many names in this story as the divine arbiter of our fantasy world. If speaking by way of a character, I shall make a mention of it. Guy 1, Adrian Windcaller, an elven druid from a nearby town bringing omens of monsters, and his circle is at a loss to explain their recent appearance. Guy 2 was Krong, a human barbarian from the mountains who came to town to trade. His tribe was content to remain isolated, but monster attacks have forced him to come and barter for arms from Icewind Dale. Fedora Weeb, Samayus, a tiefling warlock beholded to an ancient and primordial evil in exchange for forbidden knowledge. He may know more about the troubles of this realm than he lets on. The Beast, Nami-kun, a kitsune rogue, came in as a guard protecting a caravan from a distant land. By the way, she's also a 14-year-old girl. <laughs> I died a little inside. <laughs> if a system uses XP, I usually reward XP for a good backstory from my players that ties their character into the setting. I find that it helps to get people invested in the game and their characters, and everyone likes a little bonus. Adrian, Krong, and Samayus enjoyed a healthy starting bonus of 100 XP, my standard reward. Namikun, however, was offended that I didn't think his backstory was particularly outstanding or relevant to the setting, and didn't give him an XP reward on par with the other players. Namikun went on to explain his argument in full. A teenage Japanese fox girl totally belongs in a caravan's guard. She's entirely unassuming. Nobody would ever expect her to be as deadly as she is. So when raiders would try to raid the caravan, they would overlook her, and then she would sneak around and stab them all in the back because they're more focused on the guys in full plate. The caravan guard obviously recognized the advantages of having her along for the trip and decided to sign her on with a healthy contract. I'm the GM. My word is God's word. I weighed the merits of this story. While feasible, it was entirely outlandish, even for a game of make-believe, and I told him that. Still, I did end up giving a reward of 50 XP. It was met with incredulity. Namikun laid it on thick, saying, Whatever, dude. Even though you can't recognize how good my backstory is, it's okay. I'm sure you're a great GM. Fine. Have a hundred XP, I said. Namikun replied, No, that's okay. You clearly think my story isn't worth it, so <laughs> I'll take 50. Jesus Christ. All right. Glad that's sorted then. Everybody finished up their character sheets, and we agreed to meet next Sunday to continue the game. On my way out, Namikun waddled up to me and said, Hey, I'm sorry if I was rude. I'm excited to play this game. It sounds like you did your work, and I'm excited for my character, that's all. I was hoping you would be too. I genuinely did appreciate that. The way that he spoke was heartfelt. Maybe 
Underneath this lumbering leviathan, there was a diamond in all that rough. I told Namakun, hey, it's all right. I wasn't trying to single you out or give you a hard time or anything like that. I told him being invested in the game comes with perks and rewards, and that's why I have people do backstories. It's to get them invested. Namakun got the message. Or so it seemed. <laughs> I spent the following week preparing my notes in earnest. I'm always excited to run a game, as it's fun playing God. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a quick brief of everybody in the town, what they did there, who knew who and why, and just what this town had for our players to do, should they choose to accept it. That's always the unspoken thing about GMing, that big if. There's no guarantee your players will ever take the bait that you dangle in front of them. They could very easily say, screw this, we're going down to Waterdeep for blackjack and hookers. And me, well, I'd oblige them, within reasonable limits of course. It's a common occurrence for half of my elaborately prepared notes to meet the trash heap. Next week came around, and I returned to the house of Namikun. Namikun was excited to begin our game. He showed me a revised backstory which, while relatively samey, included new details, such as the owner of the caravan being Namikun's father, and that her family had always been nomadic, such that it wasn't strange for them to be wandering through the icy wastelands of the north. They're just on the move all the time. However, Namikun's father had been to Icewind Dale before and was fond of the town, and so we wanted to make a visit for the upcoming festival. Here we go! Let's party! I decided to be nice. I told him that I did appreciate the effort, and I told him to take the full 100 XP that everyone else did. After everyone had filed in, the game officially began. In my best narrative voice, I recounted once more the story. Icewind Dale was a small fishing village nestled within the spine of the World Mountains. Rumors have abounded of late that monsters and perhaps even fouler things have infested the mountain passes, sacking caravans and starving the small village of supplies. You've all arrived in this town for a multitude of reasons, and you now find yourselves taking refuge from a brewing winter storm in a tavern known as the Hearth and Helm. As you stand warming yourselves beside the fire, you hear the creaking hinges of the door move and a figure steps in out of the snow, sealing the portal behind him. A man clad in plate armor shakes off the cold and advances towards your party. New faces in town, eh? Well met, strangers. My name's Rathgar, captain of the town guard. Tell me, what brings you to our humble village? Namakun immediately pipes up. I came here with my dad for the upcoming festival. I'm gonna get a drink now. She wanders away from the rest of the party, who are still standing by with the now-confused guard captain. Without missing a beat, Namakun asks me who's serving drinks at the bar. There's a wench there, slinging mugs of ale to different patrons, and she's quite busy at the... Namakun interrupts again. How old is she? Is she cute? GM, 30, and sure, yes, but she's busy. You gotta wait. Namakun dejectedly shuffles back to the party. Adrian, the druid... There have been monsters roaming the hills, and my circle can't explain from whence they came. I can't speak for the others, but I've come here to warn you, GMS Hrothgar. I were aware. We've been receiving reports from our scouts of goblins moving in from the mountains. All we are certain of is that they're a threat to the caravans that sustain this town. I can't spare the guard to go and cleanse their nests, as it would leave us vulnerable. Perhaps we might be able to enlist your help. To dispatch of these troublesome pests. Krong? Huh, I thought you'd never ask. Where are these goblins? Hrothgar? Travel a day to the east along the mountain road, and you'll find some caves. Inside they've made their nest. Good luck and godspeed, wanderers. We pray for your safe return. And with that said, Hrothgar left the party to their own devices. Namikun was bent on getting a drink from the bar before anything consequential happened, however. Namikun, I walk up to the bar. Is the barkeeper still busy? Game Master, no. The wench has reached a lull in business and is taken to wiping clean some mugs. She sees you approach the bar and asks you, what'll it be, stranger? Namikun, what's the wench wearing? Oh, Jesus, help me. <laughs> GM, Wench clothes. <laughs> Namikun, can you, uh, see some skin? GM, sure, whatever. You can see some cleavage, it's good for business, and the drunks tip big for it. 
I was ready for an endless stream of questions along this line of thought at this point, but surprisingly, Nami-kun threw me for a loop. Nami-kun, I tell the wench, I'll take a flagon of her best ale. GM, she pours you a glass and deposits it on the bar in front of you, and tells you with a smile that that'll be ten copper pieces. Nami-kun rolls some dice. I ask her if there's any other way that I could possibly pay for it, as I take a finger and pull down the front of my shirt a bit. <laughs> Seventeen for diplomacy. GM as the wench. Nope, cash only. And we don't do tabs either. Now pay up or I'll call the guard. Namikun begrudgingly gives the wench ten copper pieces and slams back the drink. She doesn't tip, she just stands up and rejoins the party over at their table. Now, I'm gonna stop here and interject with something. I remember being a hormonal teenager, and when I first started playing D&D around 12 or 13, it was easy to lose yourself in the lewd and levacious mental images of a lusty bar wench whom one could simply m'lady into their bedchamber. However, we're all adults, questionably, in this room. Everybody was somewhere in their 20s. While I don't discount the joy of erotic roleplay, I'll only indulge in that with women. And even then, that doesn't always end well, as previous experiences have shown me. Go check out the Madame Fatale video for that info. <laughs> I thought that everyone had moved past sexy time with the boys. I guess I was wrong. With the party reunited, they finally decided to exit the tavern and go seek out the local general store to equip themselves for the coming journey. This passed relatively uneventfully, outside of Nami-kun pilfering a few small items from the shelves, much as a rogue would. They then flooded out into the streets, chatted with the locals for a bit, and Samayus even brought some medicine to an old alcoholic fisherman. <laughs> Finally, after contenting themselves with the sights and sounds of the city, the party gathered itself together and made way towards the mountain pass. It was here that I called a break, as we'd been at it for an hour or two and I wanted to stretch my legs. During the break, Namikun asked us if we were getting hungry, which a few of us were, and he even asked if we wanted some pizza. What's a tabletop game without some snacks? Come on now. Sure, we'll even pitch in. He told us not to worry about it, and said that today he'd take care of us like a good host should. Without getting up from his seat, he tilted his head back and screamed as loud as he could at the ceiling. <laughs> Mom! Order a pizza! The usual! That poor woman upstairs. I can only imagine how she feels, tormented by the demanding cries echoing up from the bowels of her house. <laughs> the pit hungered, and it demanded sustenance. <laughs> I felt even worse upon realizing that it was his mother, not Nami-kun himself, who would be feeding us that day. It would be one thing if he bought all of us food of his own volition, but to so impersonally strong-arm his mother in defeating not only him, but whoever else he decided to bring into her home, just seemed wrong to me. She wasn't even fostered the dignity of it being a request, let alone a request made face to face. No, just a disembodied voice rising up from beneath her home, demanding its needs to be met into all eternity. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that is like a nightmare. I excused myself to go to the bathroom. I went upstairs and slipped ten bucks into the vegetable crisper in the fridge. God knows Namikun will probably never look in there. <laughs> I went to the bathroom, splashed some water on my face, and steeled myself for my return to the dungeon. I took my seat again. And as everyone settled in, we resumed the game. The party had made its way to the mountain pass east of town and found the cave in question. Upon heading inside, they were attacked by a pack of goblins rummaging through a ruined cart and picking through its wares. Mid-fight, the pizza arrived. His mom brought it downstairs. We all thanked her for bringing it down and for having us over while the ungrateful dweller in the abyss only acknowledged her presence to complain about how long the delivery took and berate her for not heating it back up. And then he proceeded to ignore her. God, what a little bastard. <laughs> Bye, little bastard! He dismissively remarked that she was making a bad impression of him to his new friends after she went back upstairs and returned to pouring all of his attention over the battle map. Sure thing, bro. It's totally your mom that's making you look bad here. <laughs> the fight was tough, as I had promised my players, and Krong fell unconscious during the battle. That's basically what barbarians do, isn't it? <laughs> a 
But the day was won in the end, and they gathered up the remaining wares from the broken wagon and dragged their fallen companion back to town over the snowdrifts. They took him then to the local temple to get aid for their wounded companion. Krong was left at the temple to recover, and the party returned to the tavern. Samayus and Adrian rented some rooms like normal people and, re <laughs> and retired to their chambers for the evening. With the session winding down, however, and everyone else indisposed, Namikun saw her chance. That same look of intensity washed over her face as she sauntered back over to the bar. The same wench from earlier was starting to close up shop. Namikun, Hey, baby. <laughs> remember me? GM is wench. Yeah, I remember you. What do you want? Namikun rolls some dice. I don't want to drink. I want to know if you're free after work. And if you want to, you know, want to shack up with me tonight. He rolls his dice and everyone leans in to look except for me. I got a nat 20 on my diplomacy. Namikun was positively glowing at this achievement, looking at me triumphantly. There isn't exactly a common consensus on what rolling a nat 20 means. A nat 20 or natural 20 is the highest or best roll that you can get in a d20 based game. Usually when you roll a 20 sided die and add your modifier, you're looking to beat a target number based on the difficulty of the challenge. A common misconception that has turned into a common rule for many players, however, is that rolling a nat 20 means automatic success. Inversely, rolling a 1 is commonly misconstrued as an automatic failure. These house rules are extrapolated from combat rules, wherein a 20 is a critical hit, and a 1 usually results in something bad happening, like dropping your weapon or ending your turn flat-footed. People have since decided, however, to apply this critical system to skill checks in more recent times, and I absolutely hate it with a passion. Judging by the reactions from across the table, with all the boys shouting, Ooh! And Nice! meant that I was dealing with the common misconception group. I could have set that skill check so high that nobody could ever pass it. However, reading the room, I realized that denying Namikun's sexual conquest of the barmaid wouldn't have been a popular move. Damn you, peer pressure. <laughs> GM is the wench. Here's my key. The room's upstairs, the first one on the left. I'll see you there. And I decided then that the game was concluded. I gave a short and sweet exposition. And so, our intrepid adventurers retired to their rooms for the evening to get some much-deserved rest. I congratulated everyone on their success defeating the goblin hordes, and that next week we could all get together, maybe at the local game shop this time, and have another session, when Namikun interrupted. Namikun, But what happened? Everyone else is asleep, but my character's still awake. GM, you're joking, right? You know what happened. You seduced the wench, went up to your room, and banged her. Good job! You won the prize! <laughs> Namikun. Well, yeah, but like, how? GM, I don't know, dude. The usual way that two women have sex. You guys fucking go to bed. I'm not gonna narrate it for you. Namikun. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting rather aggravated at this point. I tell him once again that I'm not going to do it, period. And that is the end of it. Namikun, you're the worst GM I ever had. First, you trash my character's backstory because it's not good enough for you. And now you won't even roleplay with my character. After all that big talk about how you want people to engage with the story, I go to engage with it and you won't even talk about it. Every other GM would roleplay it out with me. Why won't you? You don't want to talk about two girls having sex? You're not gay, are you? Maybe I want to roll on it and see how good I please my lady. <laughs> He's breathing pretty heavily at this point, and I'm getting pretty mad at this point. I tell him, I don't give a damn what you want. You're gross. You don't know how to interact with people or respect their boundaries, and you're rude to your mom. You need to sort your shit out. He got visibly upset and stood up from the table. I'll never forget that image. A greasy, fat little man, bright red in the face, spitting pure venom at me and demanding that I leave his house. My anger at the situation paled in comparison, however, to the abject horror that I felt noticing his stubby little erection <laughs> crowned by a single wet spot of fabric. Oh my god, dude. No fucking way. 
You're right, Nami-kun. I need to get out of your house. Have a nice life. TLDR. <laughs> God. <laughs> what a fucking ending, dude. I'll buy the whole story up until the ending bit, but even if that is a fake ending, it is the perfect way to close the story out. Bravo. Oh my god, it's so hilarious. I really like the way that you described how he interacted with his mom. It's just like, the the pit needs sustenance or whatever you said. It's too good, bro. Eventually, I'm going to compile all of these Ramtide stories into one video. You have officially been bookmarked, my friend, and I will be looking forward to so much more from you. Oh, these, these tabletop stories, man. It fits right in with the neckbeard culture thing. I understand there are some people who don't want to wait for the payoff, but it seems to me that the payoff in these stories is damn good. <laughs> we'll try out some more game tales and RPG horror stories and stuff like that. See if it meshes with the channel. There's also a lot of other subreddits that I have my eye on. Creepy asterisks, fat logic, creepy PMs, not like other girls, incel tears, bad women's anatomy. I've been shopping around YouTube quite a bit uh, looking for some more stuff to cover. And this trip into tabletop gaming has kind of expanded my horizons, you know what I mean? Started out that I was just searching for the word legbeard on Reddit since the, <laughs> the sub moved so slow. Found Ramtide and Game Tales. Okay, we'll share that. And now it's just grown and it's blossoming into something beautiful. <laughs> Ramtide himself seems like a pretty cool dude. Extremely tolerant uh, of other players, even despite their obvious uh, shortcomings. You know what I mean? He didn't nope out of there when he saw a, a fox girl pillow or whatever the hell it was. He's just like, okay, I'll roll with the punches. I think the last straw was when the sweet little old lady, his mother, started to get disrespected. And he's like, dude, you need to sort your shit out, which is exactly the right thing. I think that that Lardo's probably a, a bit too dense to actually self-reflect at all, but <laughs> hopefully it pierced through somehow. Just a single ray of sunlight finding its way somehow into the uh, deepest caverns of his mind. Now you got me talking all eloquent and shit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, dude. I, I hope to see more from you soon. Absolutely fucking beautiful. Samayus loses his cool. Hey, friends. I've really been enjoying sharing these with you guys. People have been messaging me for more stories, and I'm rather flattered by all the you-should-be-a-writer remarks. Believe me, I'm working on it, guys. You're basically there as far as I'm concerned, buddy. These are like the best written stories that I think I've seen. These stories do keep getting narrated, so I'm just gonna keep on going. You motivate me, I motivate you. <laughs> Today, I present, for your amusement, yet another tale from the tabletop. Lovingly subtitled, The Orda of the Fedora. <laughs> this took place a few weeks after my encounter with a maladjusted basement dweller who we now know as Nami-kun. You can find a riveting narration of that story on Red X's YouTube channel here if you're not up to speed. Dang, got the link and everything. Up top. <laughs> After that session, Namikun was barred from our tabletop group. Semayus and I butted heads for a bit over the excommunication of Namikun from our circle. He insisted at first that I had to give him a second chance. Namikun didn't have very many friends, and even though I was uncomfortable with his role playing and behavior, maybe having some good people around him could help him overcome his flaws. I, however, was still shell-shocked by my encounter with that ham beast, and had had enough of Namikun's antics after just two sessions. I put my foot down, saying, he can find new friends to help him grow as a person. I couldn't stand the guy, and it was not my job to form him into a functional human being. Samayus eventually stopped bringing up the issue. Way to stand your ground, OP. <laughs> Definitely don't have to put up with that. My group was at a suboptimal number of players now. My sweet spot is four people, and we were only three in number. We would play, and I would mosey around the shop whenever I wasn't busy with the game trying to turn up new players for the party. I eventually struck pay dirt. I found Biggie and Smalls playing some 40k. Yeah, get them Warhammer figurines, boy. Biggie was a healthy boy. <laughs> Easily standing half a head taller than me. For frame of reference, I'm about six feet tall. This, however, was not the only way in which he was prodigious. His triple XL t-shirt seemed strained by the sheer amount of human that it attempted to contain. <laughs> His size put even the plentiful bulk of Namikun out to pasture. 
Never once did I see him without crumbs speckled in his mustache and beard, like cheap Christmas decorations upon a great hairy tree. <laughs> he glistened beneath the lights of the shop, clearly overheating from excitement, or exertion, or possibly both. Damp swaths of cotton peeked out beneath his armpit, but thankfully his offensiveness was merely visual. On the opposite side of the table was Smalls, clad in black and camouflaged cargo pants, constantly fidgeting with the strap of a single fingerless glove before he would methodically move his miniatures across the table. He was slightly pungent, as a man wearing a black leather trench coat on a summer day would be, but not overbearingly ripe. Thankfully, our local game shop enforced a rather strict hygiene policy. These two were fast friends, regularly coming together to paint armies and wage endless war across the cosmos. What army are you playing, though? Because when it comes to Warhammer, Beastmen or Bust. I approached them, friendly and outgoing, and asked if I could watch their game for a bit, and complimented them on the paint jobs that they had done on their armies. They spurred out a bit about the lore, which is fine, because I do love the lore of Warhammer, Blood for the Blood God, and Skulls for the Skull Throne. <laughs> I, however, am poor, and can't justify spending hundreds of dollars on miniatures, so I never got into the game. I do feel that. Maybe that's why I only played Beastmen, because I couldn't afford another army. <laughs> My poll at this local game shop was tabletop RPGs, and I mentioned that I had a group going, but it was a bit low on players. I continued, explaining that it was a 4th edition game, and the background and events of said game, when we met to play, and the players currently involved. And then I sprung the question, would one of you guys like to join us? They both answered in the affirmative, and asked me if I would take two. Absolutely. Who was I to break up this beautiful bromance? I like five players at a session. There's enough people to keep it interesting without things getting overwhelming. And if the party ever puts something up to vote, there's a tiebreaker. So I told them to roll up characters at the current party level and to bring some backstories that tied them into the game. I took down their phone numbers, and within the week, they had shown me their character sheets and backstories. I gave them the go-ahead. Where we last left off, you'd met our cast of intrepid adventurers. Adrian the Druid, Krong the Barbarian, and Semaius the Warlock defeated the goblin menace that had threatened the small hamlet known as Icewind Dale. With the town saved and the wench molested, <laughs> the party had begun to travel south through the spine of the world mountains, and down the highway towards the city of Neverwinter. After rescuing a merchant caravan from some bandits, they were told rumors of a brewing insurrection within the Great Keep's walls. Spurred on by the promises of treasure and glory, our heroes reached the metropolis, and lodged for the night at, surprise, another tavern. <laughs> when the next session with our new additions came around, our table consisted of the following individuals. Me slash OP, the GM. You may call me God. I accept offerings of Hot Pockets, Mountain Dew, and good tabletop etiquette. If I'm speaking by way of an NPC, I will make a note of it. Guy 1, quickly becoming an IRL friend, his character was Adrian Windcaller, an elven druid from the mountains surrounding Icewind Dale. He had helped to save the town from a goblin horde, ensuring the safety of supply caravans to the region. He now searches for the root of the evil that brought forth these monsters. Guy 2, another good bro. His character was Krong, a human barbarian, also from the spine of the world region. Having secured the trade caravans to the town, a steady supply of glimmering steel could be traded with his barbarian tribe. He too is set off to cut up evil at its roots. Fedora Weeb. While we fail to see eye to eye over the fate of the now excommunicated Namikun, he was still welcome at the table. His character, Samayus, was a tiefling warlock, bound to an enigmatic entity in exchange for unimaginable powers. He hints that he knows more about the source of the troubles that plague this world than he lets on. Biggie, a sweaty man of bountiful health, and one of our newcomers. His character was Father Alain, a zealous gnomish cleric of Bahamut. A cleric is basically a priest, Bahamut's lawful good, and the deity of nobility, order, and justice. His appearance is that of a platinum dragon. Father Alain preached and ministered to the people of Neverwinter at the local temple. Smalls, the one-gloved trenchcoat kin. <laughs> His character was Grumadin, a towering half-orc paladin in service to, again, the platinum dragon known as Bahamut. He was Father Alain's personal escort and bodyguard. He protected Alain as they went about ministering to the residents of Neverwinter. Already I see problems here, cleric and paladin teaming up with a warlock. Ooh boy, 
At least the rogue is out, I guess. There is going to be some butting of heads, I'm sure. As we all sat down, greetings were exchanged, some snacks were laid out, and I introduced our player characters to the rest of the group. Father Alain even went so far as to compliment Samayus, our resident fedora lord, on how his hat made him look dashing and roguish. <laughs> Grumadin chimed in, asking where he got the thing. Samayus was absolutely flattered, most likely never having been complimented on his stylish headwear before, and he mentioned that he got it at a certain store in the mall. Ten bucks says it was Hot Topic. <laughs> Samayus was absolutely smitten by his lucky hat, saying that it was a great little touch that made his style pop. When he wore it, all the ladies stared at him. <laughs> Just a fact. I took this time, this fedora complimenting time, <laughs> to perform a final examination of the paperwork. A cursory glance at their backstories was met with a 100 EXP bonus and the GM's blessing. They both had good reason to be here in this city and motivations for their characters. Even better is that their characters already had a history together and good reason to cooperate. It would make bringing them both into the session easy. By virtue of their inseparable nature, I only had to introduce one character to the party to introduce the other. It was absolutely adorable. Even in their wildest fantasies, their bromance blossomed. I leaned over to Father Alain, who was seated at my right, and asked if he had any preferred method for me to introduce them to the rest of the party in-game. He said when they exit the tavern, he had an idea for how he wanted to encounter the party and he would roleplay it. They're even showing initiative. Did I actually get lucky and find some good players? I suppose we'll see. <laughs> the game began. The party awoke from their rest at the Neverwinter Inn, headed downstairs, had a balanced breakfast, <laughs> and exited into the street. I nudged Father Alain, and he sprung into action. As the party walked into the thronging masses of people frequenting the boulevard, Father Alain took over narrating the scene. A small gnome sat atop the shoulders of a towering half-orc clad in a chain hauberk, shouting at the top of his lungs. Father Alain, Repent! Repent of your old ways and turn from the darkness! Embrace the glory of Bahamut and work noble deeds in his name! Lend me thine ears and hear the tale of how Io's division birthed a just and heroic lord. He rolled a diplomacy check, hoping to draw a crowd. I informed him that none of the passers-by are interested in a single word he has to say. The party, however, does the polite thing, and approaches the didactic duo. Samayus takes the initiative. Samayus, God, is it real? <laughs> a riveting speech. <laughs> Everyone got quiet for a moment. Expecting a follow-up to this poignant theological argument regarding the existence of fictional gods, Samayus reclined in his seat. He exuded the unfathomable charisma of an atheist debating a soapbox preacher on a Friday night. Grumadin broke the silence. Grumadin? Should I crush him? Father Alain? No! Despite his unpleasant demeanor, this devil child has done us no harm. For those who might not know, a tiefling is a half-human, half-devil slash demon hybrid. Naturally, it's for edgy players only. Samayus was not content with his witty one-liner, however, and broke into a long monologue. Samayus, I know everybody needs a crutch to deal with the pain of existence, but if you just accepted the nature of reality instead of relying on a made-up god to justify your actions, <laughs> you'd be a lot happier. Believing in a god is for weak people. The only thing that really matters is power over others. I guess I won't judge your foolishness too hard. <laughs> Not everyone can be enlightened by the power of their own intelligence like we are. Isn't that right, guys? I'm euphoric. <laughs> Driven by this weighty argument, his hat began to tip. <laughs> this is about the typical reaction that I'd expect from a half-demon warlock edgelord hearing gospel for the first time. I knew after reading the backstories of Alain and Grumadin that there would be some friction between the party. What I didn't expect was to hear Adrian add to the conversation, but he was a bit of a lore junkie and couldn't resist the opportunity. Adrian, By the Raven Queen! You mind your arrogance or I will send you to see her. Need you be so rude to complete strangers? You insult me by lumping one of her faithful in with the likes of you. What's more, by virtue of your own lineage, you yourself are descended from otherworldly beings. 
How can you be so asinine as to reject your own heritage just to appear superior? Samayus. Yeah, well, unlike your god, at least my dad's real. Like I said, religion is for stupid people, right, Krong? Krong had a negative intelligence modifier. Krong? Yeah, <laughs> Krong will smash your stupid religion. You guys are dumb. The party was transfixed on this theological discussion. It permeated the rest of the session as a sub-theme while they went on about their business in Neverwinter, investigating the rumors of a brewing insurrection. As the party meandered through the city streets, a thief stole Elaine's holy symbol, and the party pursued them. Running through the streets, Samayus kept pace alongside Grimadin and Elaine. Samayus, Where's your god now? If god existed, why do you let you get robbed, huh? <laughs> why don't you just have your god get you a new one? Maybe if you pray hard enough, the thief will give it back. <laughs> Bahamut, come down from the clouds and smite this knave. He giggled euphorically with each joke. At least someone was entertained. The thief then dropped down into a manhole in the streets and into the sewer. The party followed them in, suddenly in an underground den filled with beggars and cut purses. Alain's assailant stepped out from the billowing smoke and thronging mass of people, addressing the party. GM is Reinhardt. I apologize for the rude introduction, but uh, you look like the type of people who can get things done. You must understand, there isn't much time. I had to bring you here, and fast. Follow me, and I'll take you to my lord. Reinhardt returned the stolen property to the gnomish cleric, apologizing profusely. Krong? I guess God heard his prayer, huh? How profound. They were led to an antechamber occupied by a young man wearing tattered and filthy clothing, sitting atop a wooden chair at a set table, writing in a book. Reinhardt held the door, and after the party filed in, sealed it behind them, and bowed to the young man before introducing the new arrivals. The man stood up and looked them over. GM is the king in rags. Greetings, friends. I shall spare you the pleasantries of a formal introduction, for many here simply call me the king in rags. I was once rightful heir to the throne of Neverwinter, but... My brother has usurped my authority, and he's cast me out from the keep. He now occupies the throne, levying oppressive taxes against the commoners of this once fair city. Many have fallen destitute, and now seek shelter here in these sewers. Others have turned to stealing just to survive. The city is now on the edge of open rebellion, but it will be put down, unless we have a symbol behind which we can all rally. GM is the king in rags. I would ask you then, friends, should you find my cause just, to infiltrate the castle and retrieve from me my coronary robes, known as the Mantle of Kings. The peasantry know that he who wears these robes has been ordained by the gods themselves to rule over our fair city, and it would serve to rally them beneath my banner, that we might reclaim our destinies. What say you? Krong blurted out, God isn't real. Are you going to pay us? Quest? Accepted. <laughs> and there's where we cut the session that day. Everyone spent a good 15 or 20 minutes buzzing about it. Alain and Grimadin turned to Samayus and say that they really enjoyed his role-playing that session. He was a great antagonistic force to their characters. Samayus, positively glowing from all the compliments he was receiving today, elaborated that he practiced what he considered to be debating against the religious in real life. Every time he saw a Christian outreach group on the streets, he would present them with his bulletproof arguments, using their faith as a chance to hold his skills. This was one of his favorite pastimes. To this day, he had never lost an argument. I interrupted their conversation, telling them that, as fun as it was, conflicts have a way of finding a resolution. Whether the resolution to this in-character conflict was an agreement to disagree, somebody's conversion to or renunciation of their faith, or even bloody violence, it was all on the table, and I would play no favorites. The dice would decide. Alain and Grumadin thought that this would be a cool arc to explore. Samayus protested, however, saying that violence wouldn't be fair because the atheists were outnumbered if it came to blows. He also didn't want to see the cleric and paladin renounce their faith either because it would be cramping his unique roleplay style. I guess you can't be an edgy dissenter if everyone's in agreement. <laughs> I reminded him that a peaceful resolution was still on the table, 
and the dice and your character actions will be what sees this to the end. Besides, you decided to spark this great theological debate. I figured that you'd be interested in seeing it play out to its conclusion too. We left it at that and parted ways for the week. And we never did get much farther than that. <laughs> Next week came along, and I took that trip down to the local game shop. As I pulled into the parking lot, it seemed that a commotion was brewing outside. I noticed Alain and Grumadin, they must have went on a date, <laughs> and checked out the store that Samayus had suggested to them. They had some snazzy new accessories. They had both donned fedoras atop their heads. Samayus must have arrived at the same time as them, as he was out there too, and he seemed rather upset. I pulled into a parking spot and cracked a window to hear as I watched them from the rear view. Samayus, What the fuck, you guys? What are you doing? Grumadin, What do you mean, what are we doing? We're here to play the game. Samayus, No! What the hell's that on top of your head? Grumadin, A fedora. We liked your hat and we wanted a couple. You... Samayus, you're cramming my style, dude. If everybody wears a fedora, it's not cool anymore. Can't believe I have to explain this to you guys. I hate it when people creep on my style. Alain, it's just a hat, dude. It's not that big of a deal. Samayus, not that big of a deal. You're ripping me off. That's not cool. You need to go back and return them and then apologize to me. Grumadin, what? No, that's silly. Samayus, really? Alain, we're not doing anything to you, Samus. We just wanted some hats. Samus, well, if you won't listen to reason, then maybe you'll listen to force. Samus struck a pose, reminiscent of the horse stance from Kung Fu. Feet shoulder width, arms at each side, balled up fist turned upwards towards the sky. He then lets out an intimidating roar, a screeching, <laughs> He was powering up. <laughs> My voice is so screwed. <laughs> With the reflexes of a cheetah, or a highly stressed farm animal, he goes to swing at Alain, striking him in the face and knocking his fedora from atop his head to the ground. Grumadin leapt into action in defense of his lover, <laughs> grabbing the screeching Samayus. They struggled awkwardly for a bit while Alain picked up his hat and cried at them to stop it. People were filing out of the local game shop to see what was going on outside, as Grumadin and Alain grappled like the autistic doppelgangers of WWF superstars. <laughs> Even some of the neighbors had come out of their businesses and homes to watch the handicapped children play. <laughs> Eventually, a police cruiser pulled into the parking lot and whooped his siren. Whoop whoop! The boys broke it up. The cop took out his notepad and wrote some information down. And then, looking both entirely bemused and exasperated, got back into his squad car and drove off. The owner of the local game shop had come out, and he told that troublesome trio that they had to go. They weren't welcome in the store that day, and they all got into their cars and drove off. I sent a text to Adrian and Krong telling them that the game was cancelled. Next week we could all try again. When that week finally came around, going into the shop, I noticed a new inclusion on the shop's front door. They had hung a sign that read, No Hats. <laughs> Well, the Team Fortress 2 players are going to hate that one. Does anybody still play Team Fortress 2? <laughs> Wasn't Alain, like, the big guy? He was the biggie in the biggie smalls, right? The set of balls on this little fedora weeb to punch the bigger guy before the smaller guy. Dang, oh. It seems to me that that dude was somewhat of a gentle giant, which is good because he probably could have picked that kid up and just, like, put him into the cement. <laughs> Eat dirt. But really, this is, like, the stupidest reason to fight over, like, anything ever. <laughs> I literally could not come up with a dumber way to start a fight. Like, do you have a trademark on fedoras? I wonder what he does when he sees another guy that he doesn't know walking around with a fedora. He's just like, you gotta take that off. Hey, bro, I'm the only one that wears fedoras in this town. You gotta take that off. <laughs> it's a good way to get yourself punched in the mouth real quick. <laughs> Oh, it does sound to me like there is another part to this, but after punching somebody, like, in a parking lot, out of character, like, in real life, <laughs> how how do you get them all to sit down at the table and play nicey-nice again? It's not gonna happen. One character is going to start a fight in-game, try to kill the other characters. I'm almost positive that that's where this is headed, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. 
I definitely appreciate Ramtide putting these stories out here. It's just so shockingly entertaining. Like, I didn't realize how good these stories could be. Because you basically have two separate narratives going at the same time. There's, like, what's happening in the tabletop game, and there's also what's happening with these people in real life. And while the tabletop game is mostly adventures of daring do, the, the real-life actions are usually, like, the most spurgy things that you could possibly imagine. <laughs> it's just such a dichotomy, and I love it. God! If I could read one of these every single day, I definitely would. So, you know, he's bookmarked. As soon as there's another one out, I'm going to jump right on top of it. Thank you so much for posting these, Ramtide. I just, I just can't thank you enough. I hope you guys will holler at Ramtide as well. Let them know that we need more! <laughs> Showdown. The Warlock and I. Welcome to the final chapter of what has become the trilogy of my quest to build a functional RPG group when I first arrived in the new town and explored the depraved depths of its local game shop. <laughs> Where we last parted ways, Samayus desperately tried to maintain a monopoly on the fedora-tipping atheist market, seeing it as a integral facet of his unique and charismatic personality. He even went so far as to throw blows in the local game shop parking lot, feeling betrayed after Father Alain and Grumadin had purchased some spiffy headwear for themselves. If you're not up to speed, then I humbly suggest you ought to watch some Red X for his riveting narration of our story thus far. Ooh, I just love the plug. Thank you so much, Ramtide. <laughs> Links and everything. Wow. You can find our previous episodes in sequential order at the following two links. Part 1 and Part 2. What will become of this renegade warlock? Will he repent for his sins and amend his ways? Or will he rain hellfire and damnation down upon the heads of his enemies? Stick around and find out, friends, in the thrilling conclusion of this Tale from the Tabletop! Lovingly subtitled, Samayus the Salty. The dynamic duo notified me by text that week that they were prepared to forgive Samayus. They explained that they just wanted to come together and play RPGs. The guy spurged out a bit, sure, but they didn't want to hold a grudge and were willing to let bygones be bygones. I said, however, that I wanted nothing to do with Samayus at that point. Still, they asked me if I would reach out to Samayus and see if he would offer a sincere apology. They said that if he did, then I ought to let him rejoin the game before we convened again. Boys will be boys, and it's not like anyone actually got hurt. If he would accept those terms, it could all be water under the bridge. That's true, boys do fight sometimes, and then they're like, yeah, we're still bros. I gave it a couple of days. I wasn't in the mood to play diplomat, and the thought of Samayus made me sicker than a spoiled tendy basket. <laughs> <laughs> he had authored my misery twice now, the first entrance being my introduction to his beast friend Namikun, and twice by way of his spurging out over fashion accessories and getting my game cancelled. I never did reach out to him. About midway through the week, he gave me a call. I let it ring for a little bit before I picked it up. OP? Yeah. Samayus? Hey, bad. OP? What? Samayus? About last weekend, I... I, uh... OP? Spit it out. Samayus? You need to kick Grumadin and Alain out of the group. I hung up, put my phone on silent and laughed like a bedlamite for the next few minutes while my phone rang off the hook. <laughs> That's the right move. He had to be joking, right? The air raid sirens were sounding in the distance, and the world was turning red. I had my moment, and eventually I came back. Samayus had given up on trying to call at this point, and had taken to sending me an endless deluge of text messages all of which I steadfastly ignored. I made up my mind. He was out of the group. After starting a fight with one of my players, he expressed no remorse and demanded that I throw them out instead of him? <laughs> you are so done, dude. I started a group chat with the four remaining players and sent out the message. Samayus would not be a part of our next session. We would continue without him. Alain asked what happened and if I had reached out to our wayward weeaboo, and I said no. I was putting my foot down. I asked everyone if maybe they wanted to reschedule for a different day or perhaps someone else could host, 
hoping that we could just avoid encountering our party's former warlock entirely. Grumadin had a busy schedule, however, and the schedule we had already formed was the only one that would work for him, and nobody was really in a spot to accommodate our group. I didn't want to punish Grumadin by excluding him, so we held on to the prearranged time and place to run our campaign. The week flew by, and the time at long last came to reconvene. I arrived rather early at the local game shop that day, chuckled to myself at the freshly printed NO HATS sign on the way in, headed to my favorite table, and grabbed a seat. I laid out my binders and dice, grabbed a sandwich out of the lunch I had brought on the way, and I started to play on my phone while I waited for the others. I felt a sinister presence approaching the table, and I looked up. Samayus was walking slowly towards me. Had he been waiting for me? Today he was dressed differently. The neon anime shirts and fashionably tattered blue jeans that usually graced his frame were gone. He wore a leather jacket, and beneath it, all black. Accented, of course, with specks of dandruff and oily smears. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of those punk rocker style spike bracelets adorned his lard infused wrists. His hands were white, tightly gripping the lucky fedora that he could no longer wear inside the shop, while his greasy hair flowed dramatically in the breeze of central AC. <laughs> the soft, padded step of sneakers had been replaced by the hard clunk of black leather platform boots against the tile floor as he advanced. What stood out to me the most, however, were his eyes, for this very special occasion, Samayu spared no expense. <laughs> Beneath his guy liner, he was wearing bright green cat pupil contacts. When we locked eyes, he grinned at me. Vampire fangs. I, <laughs> I did everything in my power to resist fleeing or placing my palm to my forehead, while a tumbleweed rolled across the local game shop floor, heralding our final standoff. Today, Sam Ayus meant business, and I had truly met my match. He approached, watching me like a predator would watch its quarry as it moved in for the kill, and without saying a word, grabbed the back of a chair and pulled it out. His movements were controlled and deliberate as he took that seat. We stared each other down, not a word passing between us. The tension was thicker than even Sam Ayus himself, and I could feel him trying to explode my head by raw force of will. <laughs> I'll never know how I survived his psychic bombardment. <laughs> You're so lucky, OP. <laughs> Finally, I broke the silence. OP, what do you want, Samayus? Samayus, I do not know the Samayus you speak of. There's no one here by that name. He must still be getting used to this outfit. Samayus struggled to form words with the vampiric mandibles that filled his mouth speaking in a lisping growl. Spit dribbled into his goatee and flew from his mouth with every sentence. <laughs> he paused to wipe his chin, and I repeated my question, sharpening my tone. OP, what do you want, Samayus? Samayus, do you want to know why I play a warlock? OP, is it because you're an edgelord? <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Samayus, I never told you this when I first met you because huh, I knew you wouldn't believe me. I know most people don't when I tell them at first, but they come to realize that it's true. I play a warlock because I am a warlock. Oh boy. <laughs> I made a pact with a demon years ago in exchange for my soul. I know you can sense it. Every mortal can. OP, meds, take them now. Samayus bared his fangs and hissed at me. <laughs> I could see the saliva bubbling around his plastic teeth and streaking down his chin, and a few droplets even flew from his mouth and landed on the table. I grabbed a napkin out of my lunch and wiped up the dribble while I contemplated the cruel fate that I had met. It was all over now. He was going to spit at me until I died. A <laughs> oh, horrible death indeed, Samayus. It wasn't easy. The transformation was painful, <laughs> but what he gave me was worth it. Do you know what that demon gave me in exchange for my soul? 
autism. <laughs> oh, you got me good. <laughs> got he. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, I used. He gave me power, OP. Real power. Power to crush those who dishonor and disobey me. I thought we were friends, but everyone here betrayed me. You betrayed me, and you will pay the price. And then, when I'm done with you, I'll have my revenge on the rest. OP, you punched Elaine because he bought a hat. <laughs> <laughs> Samayus. Rationalize it however you want, but it's too late for all of you now. You've provoked my wrath, and you will regret it. OP, I'm regretting a lot more than just your wrath, Samayus. He then produced a pocket journal and a pen out of his jacket. The infernal wizard had revealed his tome of unholy incantations. <laughs> and he stood at the ready, ready to read my doom from its pages. <laughs> I had to act fast, lest my fate be sealed and I succumb to its wicked spell. Instinct compelled me, and my arm shot out from across the table and snatched the book from the mage's claws. <laughs> I love it. OP, what's this? Samayu shrieked like a banshee and tried to grab it back, but I held him at length with one hand while I opened it with the other. The shop owner yelled at us to knock it off or he'd kick us out and Sam Ayus sunk into his chair, glaring in anger at the shop owner who had now returned to his business. Were you going to shoot a fireball at the owner too, Sam Ayus? <laughs> it didn't take long, however, for him to return his attentions to me. Sam Ayus, give it back! OP, or what? He bared his teeth and hissed <laughs> once more, <laughs> matting his beard with drool. His breathing grew jagged and uneven, I could smell his unbrushed teeth from across the table as he hyperventilated through his dollar store costume. <laughs> OP, you're already on thin ice here, dude, and I know you don't want to be kicked out for good. No, you can't have this back. I think I'm going to keep this book for a while and read your fan fiction. <laughs> Stripped of his source of power, his eyes grew wet. <laughs> he tried to blink away the forming tears. The demon that had enslaved this poor soul seemed to be losing its hold. <laughs> Between the moisture in his eyes and the motion of his blinking, his contact lens shifted out of place, and he shuffled off to the bathroom to realign his demonic possession in quiet shame. <laughs> I took the time to leisurely thumb through his notebook. Between crude pentagrams, gibberish posing as incantations, and shadowy figures drawn in black ballpoint pen, it was fraught with whining journal entries chronicling his arguments with his parents, petty vendettas against his friends, and women's rejections. It was a mighty sorcerer's tome indeed. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Eventually, he returned to the table where I sat, his contact lens restored, but his confidence and guy liner forever shattered. <laughs> Sam, I use. Give it back. Or I'll lay a curse on you. He lifted his hands and wiggled his fingertips at me. <laughs> Is this real life, though? Oh, I was shaken in my combat boots from this threatening gesture. He was desperate to recover this book. Who knows what extent he would go to to retrieve it. This tome might be the source of his powers. And with it, I held all the cards. It was better to not give it up and to see this fight through to the end. OP... Do you know why I like being the Game Master, Samayus? Because I'm God. God makes the rules. Now I've got your fucking diary, and I'll gladly read this out loud to the whole game shop, and don't you think for a moment that I won't. So listen closely because I'm going to lay down the rules, and I'm only going to do this once. I spelled out my terms for his unconditional surrender. I was going to keep his diary. Permanently. If he ever approached anyone at this local game shop in a way that I didn't like, interrupted my game, or even so much as approached me again, I was going to spill all his satanic knowledge to the rest of the nerds in full, lurid detail. Every last bit, from his alleged demonic possession, to him thinking his mom was a bitch for telling him to get a job. 
<laughs> All the way back to when Stacy rejected him, despite him holding the door and tipping his hat. I slipped the book into my backpack, and I tucked my pack between my legs. With my turn set, I told him to get the hell out of my player's seat. He was dumbstruck. At length, he stood up and pushed in the chair as he bitterly lisped. You regret this, Dungeon Master. And he moved to the far end of the shop. <laughs> He picked a comic off of one of the shelves and sat down at an empty table to quietly read it by himself. One by one, my players filed in and took their seats at the table, paying no mind to the dejected form of Samayus lurking in the fringes of the shop. We began our game from where we left off. Every so often, when somebody would laugh or cheer, I would catch Samayus looking forlornly at the table where he was once welcome. Samayus eventually did apologize to everyone for his behavior over the course of a couple months, albeit one at a time, but I still didn't let him back into the group. Our party went on to campaign for many months with minimal issues, and we all became fast friends. Under the threat of social shame, Samayus kept his behavior in line. We never spoke much after that, content to exchange nods of acknowledgement to one another from afar. I approached him one day, his book in hand, and asked him if we were cool. He replied that we were and I returned it to its rightful owner. The no hat sign, however, never came down. <laughs> and that concludes this noteworthy portion of this particular tabletop group in which I participated. This is not the end, however. Take heart, my friends, for we have only scratched the surface of the naked neck beardery to which I have been privileged in my extensive career as a game master. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this particular trilogy, and I look forward to bringing you yet another sordid tale from the tabletop. Until next we meet, friends. Goodbye, Ramtide. Goodbye. I miss you. Goodbye. God. <laughs> the way that Samaeus was described as like a, a mage the entire time. His little spell book. Oh, God. It couldn't have been any better. Honestly, I think that was quite a fitting end. I'm sort of sad that he didn't get let back into the group because surely that would have led to even more stories. An absolute epic of sorts. <laughs> but a trilogy will definitely suffice. I'll cut these together at some point and it can get its own full length video, which I think will be over an hour. So you can look forward to that. The, the dry responses from Ramtide are just <laughs> the best. <laughs> it's like dudes all, I'm going to have my revenge. And Opie's like, I mean, you punched him for wearing a hat, bro. <laughs> You're the one that's being insane here. I don't know if he actually wiggled his fingers and stuff like that, but I hope that he did. I hope to God that he did. This sort of beardery is just <laughs> so unprecedented. Wow. I also think that you did a good thing by eventually giving him the book back. I mean, what are you going to keep it for anyways? You probably read the entire thing. Photocopy all the pages. Oh, that's the move to make. Then you still have a copy of his spell book, should he decide that he changed his mind. <laughs> ah, big brain time. I'm definitely enjoying these stories. I'm going to go dig through RPG horror stories, I think. Uh, that'll be the next, the next episode for tomorrow, and we'll see how it goes. Nice guys seem to have performed halfway decently, more decently than I thought, at least. So we'll see if we can continue mixing up the content. You know, beard story, random subreddit, beard story, random subreddit, back and forth, until we uh, eventually go insane. <laughs> uh, but may none of us go as insane as Samayus. And in order to ward off that incantation, I'm going to need you to do all of the following, okay? Follow this list closely, all right? Like the video comment on the video, and subscribe. And also, maybe even share it if you really want to make sure that the incantation is strong. <laughs> We've also got a link swarm down in the description. I hope you check that out. You can support monetarily through PayPal or Patreon. And you can support me socially through Twitter or Discord or Facebook or on my other channel. Because it's always nice to have that cross-platform pollination. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> And of course, I would be remiss if I did not thank my beautiful, gorgeous, generous patrons, Lady Nicks, Crimson Albedo, Dot Nathan, Robert Waits, Just Austin, Pope Squid, Rebecca H., Cider Drinker, and Tato Ferret. Thank you guys so much for helping me to live the dream, assisting me on my journey towards ascension. <laughs> but I'll totally be a paladin, not a warlock. Don't worry about that. <laughs> 
If anybody else wants to support monetarily, I mean, that is always massively appreciated. But if you can't right now, don't worry about it, bros. I just appreciate you hanging out with me today. And I definitely hope that you'll come back and join us again tomorrow. In order to do so, you will need to take care of yourself physically. Do not forget to wash your hands. Keep yourself clean. Have you been putting off that shower? Go take it right now. <laughs> and also mentally, definitely take some time out and do something that you enjoy today. Something that makes your heart sing. Because you are loved, you are worthy, and you definitely, definitely deserve it. I will see you in the next one, friends. And until then, bye-bye.